Good evening. Tonight we are continuing our spooky holiday series with Maisa Perez, the organist, by Gustavo Adolfo Becker. First written in 1861, this is an English translation by Antoinette Ogden, published in 1892. This story takes place in Sevilla, Spain, at midnight mass. Although it is set during the holiday season, it is a supernatural story and beautifully written. This is actually a very famous work in Spain, but not very well recognized in English. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Part One Do you see the one with the scarlet cloak and the white plume in his hat? The one whose jerkin seems to glitter with all the gold of the Indian galleys? He is stepping from his litter. He gives his hand to that lady. See her? She's coming this way now, preceded by four pages bearing torches. Well, that is the Marquise of Moscoso, the lover of the widowed Countess of Villapineda. They say that before he thought of paying his addresses to her, he sought the hand of an opulent gentleman's daughter. But the lady's father, who people say is something of a miser, but speak of the devil. Do you see that man coming through the archer San Felipe on foot, muffled in a dark cloak and accompanied by a single servant carrying a lantern? Now he's in front of the street shrine. As he unmuffled to bow before the image, did you notice the decoration that shone on his breast? But for that noble insignia, anyone would mistake him for a shopkeeper of the street of the Culebras. Well, that is the father in question, and see how the people make way for him and greet him as he goes by. Everybody knows him in Sevilla on account of his great fortune. Why, he has more ducats in his coffers than there are soldiers in King Philip's armies, and his galleys would form a fleet mighty enough to oppose the sultan himself. Look, look at that stately group of men. They are the twenty-four, the gentlemen of the aldermanry. Ah, and we have the great Fleming among us, too. They say that the gentlemen of the Green Cross have not challenged him, thanks to his influence among the magnates of Madrid. He only comes to church to hear their music, and if Maisa Perez does not bring tears as big as one's fist to his eyes, it will no doubt be because his soul, instead of being where it belongs, is frying somewhere in the devil's cauldron. Oh, neighbor, this looks bad. I greatly fear there's going to be trouble. I shall take refuge in the church, for I judge there will be more broadswords than paternosters in the air. Look, look, the Duke of Alcala's people have turned the corner of the Plaza San Pedro, and I fancy I see the Duke of Medina Sidona's men emerging from the alley of the Duenas. What did I tell you? They've caught sight of one another. They stop, the groups are breaking up, and the minstrels, who on these occasions are generally beaten by friends and foes alike, are running... The officer of the justice himself, with the emblem of authority and all, has taken refuge under the portico, and then the people speak of justice. Yes, justice for the poor. Come, the shields are beginning to glitter. Lord of the great power, assist us. The blows are falling thick and fast. Neighbor, neighbor, this way before they close the doors. But wait, what do I see here? They have left off before they had really begun. What is that light? A litter? Torches? It is the bishop on my soul. Our most holy lady of protection, whom I was just invoking inwardly, has sent him to our rescue. Ah, nobody will ever know what the great lady has done for me. With what interest am I repaid for the tapers that I burn before her every Saturday? See him! How handsome he is in his purple robes and his scarlet cap. God keep him in his episcopal chair as many centuries as I would like to live myself, Were it not for him, half Sevilla would be ablaze with the dissensions of these dukes. Look at them, the great hypocrites. See how they all press around the prelate's litter to kiss his ring. They all accompany him, confounding himself with his servants. Who would believe that those two, who seem so friendly in his presence, would, if they came together a half hour from now in some dark street, that is, uh, who knows? I wouldn't accuse them of cowardice, God forbid. They've given proof of their valor by fighting the enemies of the Lord. Still, to speak the truth, it seems to me that if they started out really determined to settle their differences, you understand me, really determined, it would be no difficult matter, and they would thus put an end to these continuous quarrels where the only ones that give and take blows are their kinsmen, their allies, and their servants. But come, neighbor, come into the church before the crowd fills it from end to end, for on nights like this it is sometimes packed so full you couldn't squeeze in a grain of wheat. The nuns have a prize in their organist. 
When was the convent ever favored as it is now? Other sisterhoods have made Maesa Perez magnificent offers, which is not at all to be wondered at, for the archbishop himself offered him mountains of gold if he would go to the cathedral. But it was all no use. He would sooner give up his life than his beloved organ. Do you not know Maesa Perez? To be sure, you haven't been long in the neighborhood. Well, he is a saintly man, poor, no doubt, but a man who never wearies of giving. With no relative but his daughter, and no friend but his organ, he spends his life caring for the one and repairing the other. And the organ is an old one, let me tell you, but that makes no difference to him. He takes such pains with it, and keeps it in such good order, that its tone is a perfect wonder. He knows it so well that he can tell merely by the touch, I don't know whether I told you that the poor man was born blind, and how patiently he bears his misfortune. When anybody asks him how much he would give to be able to see, he answers, A great deal, but not as much as you think, for I have hope. Hope of seeing? Yes, and very soon, too, he adds, smiling like an angel. I am seventy-six years old, and however long the life allotted to me, I must soon see God. Poor man. Yes, he will see God, for he is as humble as the stones of the street that allow everybody to tread upon them. He always says that he is nothing but a poor convent organist, while he might teach Sofagio to the chapel master of the cathedral himself. Of course he could. He cut his teeth in the trade. His father before him had the same position. I didn't know him, but my mother, may she rest in glory, used to say that he always brought the child with him to pump the organ. Later on, the boy showed great talent, and when his father died, he naturally enough fell heir to his position. And what hands he has, God bless them! They are worthy of being taken to Chicarera Street to be set in pure gold. He always plays well, always, but my dear, on a night like this, he is a perfect wonder." He professes the greatest devotion to the ceremony of midnight mass, and at the elevation of the sacred form, precisely at twelve o'clock, which is the time when our Lord came into the world, the voices of his organ are the real voices of angels. But what is the use of me telling you what you'll hear for yourself in a few moments? Just notice the people who are here tonight, and you will form some idea of what he is. Here's all the elegance of Sevilla, and the archbishop himself all come to this humble convent to hear him play. It is not only the learned people, those who know music, who understand his merit. Not so. The very rabble appreciate him. This great crowd that you see coming this way with torches, singing carols with all the might of their lungs to the accompaniment of their tambourines and drums, these are the kind of people to create a disturbance in the church. But just you wait. They will be as still as the dead when Maisa Perez lays his hands on the organ. At the elevation of the host, not a fly makes itself heard. There are great tears in every eye, and when the music stops, you hear something like a deep sigh, which proves that the people have been holding their breath in ecstasy all the while. But come, come, the bells have stopped ringing, and mass will soon begin. Let us go in. This is the good night of the world, but for none will it be a better night than for us. And saying this, the good woman, who had acted as her neighbor Cicerone, pressed through the portico of the convent of Santa Inez, and elbowing here, pushing there, made her way into the interior of the temple, there losing herself in the surging crowd. Part Two The church was profusely illumined. The torrent of light which fell from the altars and filled the edifice sparkled on the rich jewels of the great ladies, who, kneeling on the velvet cushions which their pages laid at their feet, and taking their missiles from the hands of their duennas, formed a brilliant circle around the chancel grating. Behind them, in bright gold-embroidered cloaks thrown back with studied carelessness in order to display glittering orders of green and red, their broad-brimmed felts in one hand, the plumes sweeping the floor, the left hand resting on the polished hilts of their rapiers, or caressing the pommel of their chiseled daggers, stood the twenty-four, who, with a great part of the best nobility of Sevilla, seemed to form a wall around their wives and daughters to protect them from the contact of the populace. The latter, moving about in the rear of the nave with a murmur like that of a stormy sea, burst into jubilant acclamation, accompanied by the discord of timbrels and tambourines at the appearance of the bishop. The prelate, 
surrounded by his attendants, took his seat under a crimson canopy beside the high altar and blessed the people three times. It was time for Mass to begin. Several minutes elapsed, however, and the celebrant did not appear. The crowd began to show evidences of impatience. The knights exchanged whispers among themselves, and the bishop sent one of his attendants to the sacristy to inquire into the cause of the delay. Maisa Paris has been taken ill, very ill, and it will be impossible for him to attend Mass tonight. This was the word that the attendant brought back. The news spread through the church in an instant. It produced a most unpleasant effect. The noise was such in the temple that the chief officer of justice rose to his feet and the constables entered the church to enforce silence. At that moment, an ill-looking man, ungainly, bony, and cross-eyed to boot, stepped up to the place where the prelate sat. Maisa Perez is ill, said he. The ceremony cannot begin. If you see fit, I will play the organ in his absence, for Maisa Perez is not the greatest organist in the world, nor will the instrument fall into disuse after his death for the lack of a musician to take his place. The archbishop made a movement of assent, and already some of the faithful, who knew this individual to be an envious rival of the organist of Santa Inez, were breaking into exclamations of disgust, when suddenly a great noise was heard in the portico. Maisa Perez is here! Maisa Perez is here! All heads were turned toward the crowded doorways from which these shouts came. In truth, Maisa Perez, pale and disfigured, was entering the church, carried in an armchair, which everybody claimed the honor of bearing upon his shoulders. Neither the doctor's commands nor his daughter's tears had been able to keep him in bed. No, he had said. This is the last, the last. I know it. I will not die without hearing the voice of my organ again on this solemn night, this good night. Come, I implore you, I command you, let us go to the church." His desire was gratified. The people carried him in their arms to the organ loft. Mass began. The cathedral clock struck twelve. After the introit came the gospel, the offertory, then the solemn moment when the priest, after having consecrated the bread, takes the sacred form between his fingers and begins to elevate it. A cloud of incense in bluish waves floated through the church. The little altar bells began to ring in vibrating peals, and Maisa Perez laid his aged fingers upon the keys of the organ. The multitudinous voices of its metal pipes resounded in a prolonged and majestic chord, which grew gradually fainter as though the breath of the wind had borne away its last echoes. The first chord, which seemed like a voice from the earth calling out to heaven, was answered by another that seemed to come from a great distance, soft at first, and then swelling until it became a torrent of thundering harmony. It was the voice of the angels which had traversed space and reached the earth. Then followed what seemed like canticles sung far away by the hierarchies of seraphim, a thousand hymns at once blending into one, which itself was no more than an accompaniment for a strange melody that floated upon that ocean of mysterious echoes as a mist floats over the waves of the sea. Then various chants dropped out of the harmony, leaving two voices which finally melted into each other, and this last isolated voice lingered long, sustaining a note as brilliant as the thread of light. The priest bent his brow, and above his white head, through the blue gauze of the incense, he held up the host to the eyes of the faithful. At that moment, the tremulous note that Maisa Perez held swelled and swelled until an immense explosion of joyous harmony filled the church. In the far-off corners of the temple, the air seemed to buzz, and the jewel windows quivered in their tight frames. Each one of the notes which formed the mighty chord developed a theme of its own, some near, some far, some brilliant, some muffled. It seemed as though the waters and the birds, the breezes and the forests, heaven and earth were each in its own tongue singing the birth of the Savior. The crowd held its breath and listened, amazed. There were tears in every eye, and every heart was swelled with emotion. The priest at the altar felt his hands tremble, for that which he held in them, that before which men and archangels bowed, was his God, and he thought he saw the heavens opened and the host transfigured. 
After that, the voices of the organ gradually grew fainter, like a sound that dies as it is blown from echo to echo. Suddenly, the cry of a woman, a piercing, heart-rending cry, was heard in the organ loft. The organ exhaled a strange discord, something like a sob, and was silent. The people rushed to the stairs, toward which the faithful, drawn from their religious ecstasy, had all turned their gaze. "'What has happened? What is it?' whispered they. But nobody knew what to answer, and the confusion increased, threatening the good order and pious stillness proper to a church. "'What has happened?' inquired the great ladies of the officer of justice, who, preceded by the beetles, had first penetrated into the organ loft, and who now, pale and deeply distressed, was making his way to where the bishop awaited him, anxious like the rest of the congregation to learn the cause of the disturbance. "'What has happened?' Maisa Perez is dead. And so it was. Those who first reached the organ loft, jostling one another up the stairs, had found the poor organist fallen face downwards on the keys of the old instrument, which was still vibrating, while his daughter, kneeling at his feet, was calling to him in vain with sobs and cries. Part 3 Good evening, my signora Doña Baltasara. Are you here, too, for midnight mass? For my part, I had intended on going to the parish, but you see how it is, one goes where everybody goes. And yet, to tell you the truth, since my Isa Perez's death, I feel as though there were a tombstone on my heart every time I enter Santa Ines. Poor dear man, truly he was a saint. I have a little scrap of his doublet, which I preserve like a relic, which surely deserves it, for I believe by my soul that if the archbishop would only take a hand in the matter, our grandchildren would see him canonized. But why expect it? The dead and the absent have no friends. Novelty is what is in favor now. You understand me, of course. What? You don't know what is going on? True, we are alike in that respect— from our house to church, and from church back again, without inquiring into what is said or what is not said. However, on the wing, catching a word here or a word there, without the least interest in the matter, I sometimes happen to know the news. Well, yes, it seems to be a settled thing that the organist of San Ramon, that squint eye who is always abusing other organists and who looks more like a butcher from the Puerto de la Carne than like a musician, is going to play this Christmas Eve on Maisa Perez's organ. You know, of course, for everybody knows it in Sevilla, that no musician would accept the undertaking. Not even his daughter, who is a professor of music. After her father's death, she entered the convent as a novice, her refusal was natural enough. Accustomed as we were to hearing such marvels, anything else would seem poor, no matter how desirous we might be to avoid comparisons, and so the sisterhood had determined that in honor of the dead musician, and in token of respect to his memory, the organ should remain dumb tonight, when here comes our man and declares that he is willing to play it. There is nothing so bold as ignorance. To be sure, the fault isn't his, but theirs, who permit such a profanation. But that is the way of the world. But... I say, it is no small crowd that has flocked here tonight. One might think that nothing had changed from last year to this. The same fine people, the same splendor, the same crush at the door, the same excitement under the portico, the same throng in the temple. Ah, if the dead man were to rise, he would die a second death rather than witness the profanation of his organ. But the best of it is that if what the neighbors have told me is true, the intruder is going to meet with a fine reception." When the time comes for him to lay his hands on the keys, there are a number who mean to make a hubbub with tambourines, timbrels, and drums. But hold, there is the hero of the occasion going into the church now. Holy saints, how gaudily he has arrayed himself. What a rough, and what grand airs he assumes. Come, come, the archbishop arrived some time ago, and mass will soon begin. Come, for I fancy this night will give us food for talk. And saying this, the good woman penetrated into the church, opening a way for herself through the crowd, according to her habit, by dint of pushing and elbowing. The ceremony had already begun. The temple was as brilliant as it had been the year before. The new organist pushed through the crowd that filled the naves, went up to kiss the bishop's ring, and then made his way to the organ loft, where he took his seat and began to try the stops of the organ one after another with much affectation of gravity. 
From the compact mass of people in the rear of the church rose a muffled, confused sound, a sure augury that the storm was brewing and would not be long in making itself felt. He is an impostor who cannot do anything straight, not even look straight, said some. He is an ignorant lout who has turned the organ of his own parish into a rattle and comes here now to profane Maisa Perez's, said others. And while one relieved himself of his cloak, the better to thump his tambourine, and another took a hold of his timbrels, and all made ready to greet the first notes of music with a deafening clamor, there were but a very few who ventured mildly to defend the strange man, whose proud and pedantic bearing was so strongly in contrast with the modest appearance and affable kindness of the former organist. The longed-for moment came at last, the solemn moment when the priest, after bowing his brow and murmuring the sacred words, took the wafer between his fingers. The little bells rang at the foot of the altar, shaking out a shower of crystal notes. The diaphanous waves of incense rose in the air, and the organ burst into sound. A terrible uproar filled the church and drowned its first chords. Horns, bagpipes, timbrels, tambourines, all the instruments of the populace lifted their discordant voices at once, but the clamor only lasted a minute. It all stopped simultaneously, just as it had begun. The second chord, full, bold, magnificent, sustained itself. A torrent of sonorous harmony gushed from the metal pipes of the organ. There were celestial chants, like those which caress the ear in moments of ecstasy, chants which the soul perceives, but which the lip cannot repeat, single notes of a distant melody sounding at intervals brought by a gust of wind, the sound of leaves that kiss each other on the limbs of trees with a murmur like rain, trills of the lark that rises singing from the flower-covered land like an arrow shot into the clouds, terrible bursts of sound, imposing like the roaring of a tempest, choruses of seraphim without cadence or rhythm, unknown music of another world which only the imagination can comprehend, winged canticles that seem to rise to the throne of the Almighty in a whirl of light and sound, all these things were expressed by the thousand voices of the organ, with a power and a poetry more intense, more mystic than had ever been heard before. When the organist came down, such was the crowd that pushed toward the stairway, and such was the desire to see and admire him, that the officer of justice, fearing, and not without reason, that he would be smothered, sent his beetles in order that, stick in hand, they might open a way for him to the high altar where the bishop awaited him. "'You see,' said the prelate, when the musician was introduced into his presence, "'I came all the way from my palace to hear you. "'Will you be as cruel as Maisa Perez, "'who would never once spare me the journey "'by consenting to play on Christmas Eve for midnight mass at the cathedral?' "'Next year,' answered the organist. "'I will give you that pleasure, "'for I would not touch this organ again for all the gold in the world.' Why not? interrupted the prelate. Because, said the organist, trying to control the emotion which was revealed by the pallor of his countenance, because it is old and, and poor, and with such an instrument one cannot express all that one would like. The archbishop retired, followed by his attendants. One by one the litters of the noblemen disappeared into the curves of the neighboring streets. The crowd around the portico was dissolved, and the faithful dispersed, taking their various directions. The church was about to be locked when two women, who had lingered to murmur a prayer before the altar of San Felipe, crossed themselves and went their way, turning onto the alley of the Duenas. "'You may say what you choose, my dear Dona Baltasara,' said one of them. "'But that is my opinion. Every madman with his whim.' I would not believe it if I heard it from the lips of a barefooted capuchin. It is not possible for this man to have played what we have just heard. I tell you, I heard him a thousand times at San Bartolome, which was his parish, and from which he was turned out by the priest because his music was so poor. My dear, it made you feel like stopping your ears up with cotton. And then you have only to look at his face. The face, they say, is the mirror of the soul. Think of my Issa Perez, poor dear man. On a night like this, when he came down from the organ loft after having held the congregation spellbound, what a kind smile he wore, what a happy flush on his countenance. He was old, and yet he looked like an angel. 
As for this fellow, he came stumbling down the stairs as though a dog were barking at him from the landing, and with a face as pale as that of a corpse. Believe me, my dear, in all truth, there is some mystery here. Part 4 A year had elapsed. The abbess of the convent of Santa Inez and the daughter of Maisa Perez were speaking in a whisper, only half visible in the shadows of the choir. The bells with loud voices were calling to the faithful from the height of the steeple. Every now and then one or two persons crossed the now silent and deserted portico, and, after taking holy water, they chose their place in the corner of the nave, where a few neighbors were quietly waiting for midnight mass to begin. "'Do you see?' the abbess was saying. "'Your fears are supremely childish. There is scarcely a soul in the church.' You should have more self-confidence. All Sevilla is at the cathedral tonight. Play for us, my child. It is just as though we were alone. Why do you sigh? What is the matter with you? Speak. I am afraid, exclaimed the girl in a shaken voice. Afraid? Why, what do you mean? Afraid of what? I, I do not know. Uh, something supernatural. Last night... Listen... I had heard you say that you were anxious to have me play for Midnight Mass this Christmas Eve, and proud of the distinction, I, I thought I would first try the registers and, and practice a little that I might surprise you and, and, and do you honor today. I came to the choir alone. I opened the door which leads to the organ loft. The cathedral clock just then was striking the hour. I don't know what hour, but the strokes were many, many, and so sad. The bells went on ringing during all that time that I stood petrified on the threshold. It seemed an age to me. The church was empty and, and dark. Far away, yonder, a little light glimmered like a star, lost in the night of the sky. It was the dying light of the lamp which burns before the high altar. By its faint reflection, which only added to the profound horror of the darkness, I saw it. Yes, I saw it, Mother, do not doubt me. I saw a man who, sitting with his back to where I stood, was running one hand along the keys of the organ while he touched the stops with the other, and the organ sounded, but in a most indescribable manner. Every note was like a sob stifled within the metal pipes, which vibrated, reproducing the tone, muffled, almost imperceptible, but with wonderful accuracy. The cathedral clock was still striking the hour, the man was still trying the keys. I could even hear his breathing. The blood in my veins was frozen with horror. I felt a chill run through my body. My head was hot. I tried to scream, but I could not, for the man sitting there had turned his face and was looking at me. No, I don't mean that. He wasn't looking, for he was blind. It was my father. Come, come, sister. You must try and banish these foolish fancies with which the arch-enemy tries to disturb our weak imaginations. Say a paternoster and an Ave Maria to the archangel St. Michael, captain of the celestial hosts, that he may succor you from evil spirits. Wear on your neck a scapular, touched by the relics of San Pecomio, counselor against temptations, and go, my child, go and take your place at the organ. Mass is about to begin, and the faithful are waiting with impatience. Your father is in heaven, and it is far more likely that from the home of the blessed he will inspire you on this holy night rather than appear to give you a fright. The abbess went to take her seat in the choir in the midst of the sisterhood. The daughter of Maisa Perez opened the door of the organ loft with trembling hand and sat on the stool before the organ. Mass began. Mass began and nothing unusual occurred until the time of the consecration. At that moment the organ sounded, and with the first sound came a shriek from the organ loft. The abbess, the nuns, and some of the faithful ran to the organ. Look at him! Look at him! cried the girl, whose eyes, starting from their sockets, were fixed upon the stool from which she had just risen in terror. She stood clinging with convulsed hands to the railing of the loft. All eyes were turned upon the point which she indicated. There was no one at the organ, and still it went on sounding, like the voices of archangels in a burst of mystic joy.
Did I not tell you so? One and a thousand times, my good Doña Baldassara, did I not tell you so? There is some mystery in all of this. Listen. What? Did you not attend Mass last night? Anyway, I presume you know what occurred. Why, it is the talk of Sevilla today. The Archbishop is furious, and with good reason. Think of his having missed the Mass at Santa Inez, of his not having witnessed the miracle, and all for what, pray? That he might sit and listen to a perfect charavari? For according to those who were present and who told me of it, the new organist playing was nothing else. But I said so all the time. That squint I never could have played the music we heard together last Christmas Eve at Santa Inez. It was a lie. That music came from another soul. There is a mystery in all this, my dear, a mystery, believe me. Yes, and so there was. A deep mystery, a beautiful mystery, which was the soul of Maisa Perez. Isn't this a great story? I absolutely love the way the music is written. It's evocative and poetic and mystical and a fantastic way to engage the reader in something that can't actually be described. I also really enjoy the literary device of having this uh, gossipy character narrate big portions of the action. I think it works really well. And the whole story draws upon Becker's background as a poet and as a playwright without really sacrificing what makes it work as a piece of short fiction. I also really love it when the stories on this channel refer to real places that you can see and look up and learn about. It's clear that Becker truly knows and loves Sevilla and he wants to share it with the reader. And it's really fun to look up the convent of Saint Inez and figure out the relationships between these places and people. On Wikimedia Commons, I found all these fantastic images of Sevilla in the mid to late 1800s, and I felt like they gave really great context to all the written descriptions in the story, and they bring all these street scenes really to life. To be honest, I haven't been able to figure out if this story was an existing legend and Becker simply wrote a version of it, or if he completely invented this story from scratch. While all the sites that refer to it as a local legend of Sevilla ascribe the story to Becker, the convent of St. Inez kind of represents the story as a fact. They have that very organ in the chapel today, you can go see it, and they tell a slightly different version of the story of Maisa Perez as part of the convent history. In this shorter version, he um, promised his daughter that he would play the mass for her, but he died before he was able to, and then the following year he returns as a ghost to play it and fulfill the promise he made to his daughter. Anyway, I think this story is something on the borderline between some existing local legend and maybe just a great story that really took on a life of its own over time and became fact. Gustavo Adolfo Becker is one of the most read and most important literary figures in Spain. His work is assigned reading in school, and he's considered the founder of modern Spanish lyrical poetry. He wrote poetry, plays, short fiction, and he dabbled in journalism. Becker was born Gustavo Adolfo Claudio Dominguez Bastica in Sevilla in 1836. His father was an accomplished painter of Flemish descent, and so Becker decided to use his last name, although he was actually orphaned at a very young age. He grew up with relatives and he pursued writing and drawing, and at 17, he moved to Madrid with some of his friends to become a famous poet. As you can tell, he was influenced by the Romantic movement, as well as some other literary influences. What it meant practically is that he lived with his brother and he bounced from job to job and he hung out with other writers and he lived a very bohemian lifestyle. Also like the Romantic poets, Becker died of tuberculosis in 1870 at the age of 34, just a few months after his beloved brother. Although he had written and published several works during his lifetime, he wasn't especially famous or important until his friends gathered and published his work after his death as a way to help support his widow and children. His influence on the writing of his many literary friends is one of the reasons why his work has been so incredibly influential, and today he has a huge legacy. I'm obviously just scratching the surface here. There is a lot more information and detail about his life and work that is written in Spanish. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, I make a little confession way out here. 
This week's confession is that the YouTube algorithm appears to really approve of last week's story, The Lou Garou, and it currently has more views than any other video on my channel so far, and it has won me a bunch of new subscribers. To be honest, I sometimes try to understand if there are certain topics or regions or thumbnails or whatever that trigger more views. The number varies so dramatically. But I mostly think it really does depend more on the algorithm than on the content. Some things just get vastly more impressions than others for reasons I don't fully understand. Not, by the way, because I can't understand it. I'm deliberately choosing to curate this channel and create the content in a way that appeals to me and hope to find like-minded people rather than create content that appeals to YouTube and gets foisted on everybody else. But I am so pleased that all these new people have found the channel and have decided to stick around. And if you did miss the Lou Garou for some reason, I'm sure it will be in the end card for this video. You are listening to Restored Lore, where I find old, odd stories and share them with new audiences. If you enjoyed this week's story, please leave me a like or a comment. And if you like overlooked, obscure, interesting literature from the past, you should definitely subscribe so you never miss a story. See you next week.